you. And uh, it's a great honour to come here and, and speak to you. And, uh, and Pat has been uh, telling me of all the um, illustrious previous speakers that have been such events. So uh, um, I feel very honoured to be in their company, as it were. So I'm, I'm going to go through a few slides today and really talk about innovation as a process in the way that we've embraced it within BT and the, and the techniques that we try to use to open that up to, um, to develop co-innovation agendas with our partners, our suppliers, and, and most importantly, from my point of view, in terms of my role with customers. And, and certainly at the end, we're certainly interested in, in any kind of comments and um, uh, thoughts that you've got about how that model might be improved or what the issues might be with taking that forward. Um, the other thing to say, and, and this morning I was uh, uh, with, with Pat, we were at another event at the IPA and talking about innovation in the context of the public sector. And, and I said then that um, it's, a, you know, it's an interesting time, obviously, clearly, with the, you know, the economic environment that we're all in, and the recession and um, the, the requirements for cost efficiencies and so on. It's not confined to the public sector. It's across, across all companies, including our own, BT. It's a big company. It's a global company. Um, but you know, we've had our financial issues over the last year, 18 months. And that's, that's, that's created an environment of um, severe and you know, deep review and introspection and looking at what's right and what's wrong within our company, how to, how to, how to optimise it and so on. Um, and, you know, and, and even my own team, we've sat and been in a situation where for the last seven or eight months there has been a sort of Damocles hanging over us. And, it, and, it, and you know, it's been a very unsettling time. But thankfully we're through that now and in fact... Only in the last few days, we've now got a very clear remit going forward in terms of customer innovation engagement. And, and, and interestingly, we're, no, we're now part of the global chief architect's office for BT. And part of our remit is not only to educate, and if you like, and, and expose innovation and our innovation ecosystem and our customers, but also to be more systematic in taking feedback from customers to drive insight into our platforms and innovation roadmaps going forward so that we can be more clear about what are the right options to take in those futures, um, those forks in the road that where we haven't yet made a commitment which way we're going to go. And that, so so um, you know, it was interesting uh, being in, in, in that public sector environment this morning, but, but it, was, um, it was good for me to be able to say, that, well, we've been through that. Um, and actually now we've come out of it in terms of my team, actually with a new remit and a kind of a fresh and new sense of purpose, which, so, so there are some benefits from, from what's going on, I think. Um, so, so just moving on and, 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 and trying to take the topic um, at hand, uh, what, what clearly you know, the financial backdrop, the recession and so on, has, has certainly moved everyone to realise that innovation is absolutely an imperative for us. You know, we, we, we can't we can't get our way out of the situation that we're in simply by just cost cutting, cost cutting, cost cutting. You know, innovation is really uh, an imperative for us. Innovation is there to help us understand how we can drive cost efficiencies and so on. But also, you know, it's, it's absolutely now the way we should be investing and 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 you looking to use innovation to generate new new wealth generating opportunities as new revenue, new products, new services. Um, and again, one of one of the points I was keen to make this morning was to, to distinguish innovation from invention. I'm sure you all are well aware of this, but, but, but still it, innovations often gets associated with a kind of baggage that, that's, that, it's, that it represents invention, invention alone or its inventors or its technology driven. Uh, our view is that innovation is absolutely fundamental. It's the successful commercial exploitation of any new idea whether that's a piece of, and whether there or not there's an enabling technology behind that, it may be a new business model, it may be a new process, it may be a new way of, of uh, supporting individuals within the business or, or, or a new customer experience. But it's only innovation when the rubber hits the road and actually there's a new product in service or there's a new, there's a new process actually undertaken in the, in the business. Um, and... Innovation certainly seems, feels to me, as a, as a rising imperative in, this, in the current economic downturn. You know, as a company that's often attempting to respond to opportunities where we're responding to calls for proposals and contract opportunities 
with, with, with all sorts of companies, public sector, private sector, large and small. Innovation is not, it's not diminishing, it's increasing. You know, every major contract that we go for these days, innovation requirement is embedded in there, absolutely. And in fact, one of the key things that we've been able to do as a customer innovation engagement team is to create and be able to offer a rigorous process for innovation engagement throughout the lifetime of the contract with, with appropriate and rigorous governance associated with that, and in some cases, joint innovation funding to support whatever you might do as a result of taking that forward. But um, it, there's no question that in the current, in current climate that innovation as an, as an imperative is on the increase, it's not on the decrease. And that's not new, I mean, and, and many of you will be more expert in terms of the, the history of innovation and great innovations in response to adversity and so on throughout the years. Um, and I'm not going to go into any detail on any, on any of these, but you know, there, there, is a, there are absolutely, we can look back in history and you can see how different situations, economic or, or, or um, political situations and so on, adversity has a driven invention and innovation to create new opportunities, new ways of moving forward. And great new companies often have come out of those. Um, but the, so, so innovation is an imperative, particularly in a context of innovation requirements when there is a, uh, a financial, uh, difficulty, financially difficult situation. It has, has been around a long time. I think what, what is changing is the model of innovation. Uh, and I think if you can look back in history, and in fact I can look back just over the, the 20, 25 years that I've, I've been in BT, that you know, innovation has moved from being the preserve of the great inventor, the brilliant mind, the person who could grasp a concept and drive that forward as an individual with bringing people around them into team-focused efforts, associate that, that, that sort of element in the middle really with the corporate R&D culture that's kind of grew up in the middle of the last century and, and frankly, it was the culture that I joined in BT in the mid-80s. You know, innovation was going to come out of our research and development team, and that was based in a certain place, and that's where all the investment went, and that, and that, that was the view. Clearly now, partly because of enabling technologies, but, um, and all, but mainly because of the realisation that, that no one is the master of great ideas. You know, great ideas can come from anywhere and anyone. And the, the real... Uh, <coughs> methodology to be successful at innovation is to be the expert at, harness, at harvesting those, at gathering those, and then turning those into business advantage. And I use the Airbus example as a great example of collaboration. You know, hundreds of companies, one way or another, contributed to the creation of that world-leading um, A380 aircraft. Um, and, and Airbus, whilst contributed their own significant uh, innovation or invention elements towards that, you know, the, what they were really excellent at was, was corralling that capability and bringing it together. And that's a model, I think, that we're, certainly in terms of BT, that's a model that we're, we're, we're trying to drive forward and, and trying to adopt. So our, our, our offer, if you like, to our partners and our customers is to work with us because what we're trying to do is be the hub of, of high-quality innovation in the context of network IT services. Um, and collaboration, obviously, is uh, and it, it throws up some interesting uh, difficulties occasionally, and this is maybe some of the things we can pick up in a discussion later. But quite often, you find that in order to drive the innovation, the collaboration requires the bringing together of teams that actually are not normally partners or don't or actually competitors in the same market or whatever. And the trick is to bring them together and corral them in. To, to meet a common goal, to be able to bring them together for a common purpose where the benefits of, of that outcome are obvious and just to, to try and make it topical, and I have to admit I am no expert on rugby, but uh, as, a, as a good model from sport where they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very comfortable in some instances and being in different teams and operating in different models under, in different contexts. The British and Irish Lions are a, a, you know, is a team that comes together on an occasional basis, it comes together and you, you'll find English, Irish, uh, Welsh, Scottish players playing together for a single common purpose and supporting each other. But of course, normally, in a context like of a Six Nations 
contest or whatever. It's the complete opposite of that, and they're they're absolutely, you know, um, are playing for their own teams. So, so you know, there's some great, I think, learning from 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 the sort of world of sport that we can that we can try and draw on. And, and so again, there's a, there's a competence that we're trying to develop is how do you bring those people together that might normally be. Uh, competitors or, or in different different uh, different have different uh, objectives, but to work together to, to the, for the common good. Um, and just going back to my point about you know innovation can come from anywhere. I use this quote from William Gibson uh, uh, that uh, the future's here; it's just not well distributed. You know, there there, there are one, one of the one of the real. Um, uh, challenges I think we have in order to be to be world class innovators is to be able to spot the right opportunity at the right time or the right enabler at the right time and turn that into some business advantage and a, and a really very trite example of how um, uh, the, these things can happen is if you look at what 's happened in the context of something like YouTube that clearly has grown into this, um, massive sort of viral capability for sharing sharing um, video clips about all sorts of things, some very sensible things, some maybe less sensible things, and so on. Um, you know, there's massive popularity around things like watching a 10-second watching a, 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 a video clip of someone falling over at a wedding or someone, you know, a, a baby gurgling or whatever. You know, 20 years ago, we had TV programs that made a living out of showing things like that. I forget the names of them now, You Be Framed or whatever, you know. Um, and, and people would create a video, they'd put it on a tape, they'd put the tape in the post, and a few people might get selected, and occasionally it would come on the TV. Um, and the YouTube model has kind of just taken that, but turned that into this sort of enormous viral uh, capability. So, so you know, the, obviously there are enabling technologies that made that happen, but the concept was already there. It was about understanding how to move that forward. So from, from our point of view as a company... We, we believe that, we, over, particularly over the last six years, we've been really on a journey in terms of our innovation capability. We've transformed ourselves from this internal R&D capability um, into the concept of open innovation, um, where our internal R&D teams, they're still there, but they're there to be a hub uh, a, a, and a point of access to a, a whole global open innovation ecosystem. Um, our move has gone away from technology driven so so you know often a part of our problem would have been that we would have created a new technology and then we would be looking for the application for that technology yeah. it's not so so clearly this is the, the the innovation imperative is now driven around customer experience it has to be we move away because of the change in the way that we do that. We're able to now dynamically much more uh, plan much more dynamically, be able to bring resources to bear where opportunities are spotted that could be could be of value much more quickly and much more in a way that's much more fleet of foot, and be able to take decisions across boundaries in the organisation, across business units, traditional boundaries of funding and so on, by setting up systems that allow us to do that. Um, and obviously, our innovation internally has to be extremely purpose-driven. But that doesn't mean that we've given up the so-called blue sky uh, um, long-term research. Uh, but what we, what we have done is, is made much more use of federating that out amongst the university uh, base that we, that we work with. And some of those are key strategic innovation partners of ours, like MIT and Cambridge University in the UK. Um, but we make use of many others. And, and uh, someone earlier on was mentioning the Tyndall Institute, and you know, clearly, the work that they've been doing with us and others on um, passive optical networks uh, has been absolutely world leading. A great example of uh, um, a success from a European uh, funded program of work. And in, it's in an area that's absolutely central to our business going forward, you know, being, able, being able to uh, effectively distribute large volumes of content of, um, of information over fibre at the right cost in, in the, you know, to the homes and to businesses is clearly a core element of our work, of our business going forward. Um, and, and there's been some really useful advances in that collaborative um, project taking us forward there. And the final point is, is around this, this concept of innovation as a culture. So what we've been doing and we've spent a lot of time doing is, is driving innovation as a, as a culture into, the, into our business and to those businesses that we work with. 
and, and absolutely press home the message that innovation is everyone's responsibility. It's not the preserve of the technologists in R&D. It's, it's everyone's responsibility from, from the person on the call centre to the guy who um, installs a phone in the home right through to the MD. It's, it's everyone's responsibility to be able to think about what innovations could apply in the context of their day-to-day -day work or, or other bright ideas that they might get. But in order to do that and make that a success, we have put effort in in terms of providing them with toolkits and access to, to, to supporting functions to help them move that forward. And the reason for the picture of The Economist on there is that you know, that, that's been a significant transformation for us over the last few years. And The Economist um, did some analyses of these, the, these um, uh, R&D and innovation capabilities um, across a number of companies. And they cited us, BT, Apple, Procter & Gamble, as, as, as leaders in this area of open innovation and driving innovation as a competence into the business and into our, into our relationships with our customers and our vendors and so on. So, um, without wanting to labour the point too much, we, we um, internally focus on what we call an open innovation ecosystem, and we, and we attempt to drive that innovation at every stage in a product life cycle. So it's not only, as I say, at the invent stage, but it's about how you architect real solutions, the va how, you, how you validate those and implement those, right through to actual fulfilment with, with customers. And throughout that, so-called innovation continuum from, from start to finish, we work in a collaborative fashion with, with our customers, with, with universities, government agencies, obviously, and, and our key partners. Um, so, our, as I say, the role of R&D in terms of the industrial park facility, which is a picture of here, has changed. <coughs> and, and whilst we have got a great heritage and we're, her we're still proud of that heritage of R&D that we've done in our own right, and we continue to do research, we continue to uh, maintain and build our own patent portfolio and so on, like, like, like you would expect. Um, but the, the role here is, is, is changing, and it's about using this as a hub to access a wider act, uh, <coughs> ecosystem that I'll explain in a second. Um, and just, just as a sort of a topical aside, we were talking about earlier on um, uh, innovation and stimulating local economies and so on and working with local councils and, and government agencies to, um, to, to help make, the, make that for, move that forward. And so, so the model that's, that's, uh, that's changed for us with, with, with Adastral Park... Uh, that was um, BT's research centre. There, there's a fence around it. You can only get in it if you've got a pass to get in there and so on. It was a very traditional approach to that. That's gone away. The fence is coming down. We've already got our partners and uh, um, uh, University College London based on the site with us. Uh, and we're, it's now embedded in the growth plans and innovation plans for Suffolk County Council and to turn that into an innovation park, business and technology innovation park for the whole of the eastern region um, with an expectation to grow the presence on that park, which at the moment is about 3,500, to grow that to about 7,000 within six or seven years from now. But that growth to the other 3,500 will not be BT people. There'll be other companies, other partners and so on. Uh, but the, the ambition is to create a centre of excellence, particularly around, obviously, IT services and so on, and, and allied and associated technologies for the Eastern region, and to, and to use that as a, as a catalyst to drive innovation amongst businesses and uh, 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 large and small in the region. So, as I say, we grow out from there. Our glo we, have, we regard ourselves as having a global innovation ecosystem. Um, we have got research centres now around the world, uh, we, have, we have a research centre in Malaysia, in KL, that we, that's actually our most well-established non-UK centre. Um, we've just opened uh, a, a joint research centre in, in the Middle East uh, uh, in partnership with Eti Salat. Um, and uh, we have a fledgling lab in China and in India. Um, and we also have... The reason for the, for the many other presences on, the, on this slide is that we have also global development centres around the world that are all linked together with our, with our hub back, back in the UK, um, of which are BT global development centres. But we also have technology scouting teams. So we have people that are based, BT people that are based permanently in 
east and west coast US, in Israel, in um, Asia Pac area, Singapore and Hong Kong. That who's, and their, they, their day job is to scan what's going on in the innovation uh, infrastructure and economy there in terms of startup companies, particularly for obviously focusing on those that relate to our business. Um, but that's a, it's a capability that we now offer to our customers. So it, it, not as a paid for service as such, but in, in the context of, in a spirit of open innovation, we will work with a customer to understand their business issues. And what we'll do is seek to look, we'll seek to bring to bear whatever point of resonance we can find amongst, from across the whole of the innovation ecosystem uh, to help them move forward in their business imperatives. And so that's a programme, so that's, that's the programme actually that my, my team uh, are focused on, and it's our customer innovation engagement programme. Um, and it's exactly what it says. We, it's about driving up a relationship that's about shared risk and reward, about joint innovation, co-innovation and open innovation with, our select, with selected major customers um, around the world. Um, and it's a, it's a program that's, 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 that's gone well. It's, it's been running only for about 18 months now. We've, we've got some really good traction, both in the public and the private sector, with UK companies and non-UK companies, global companies too. And our, our, our pitch, as it were, is that we will work with you in partnership in a, in a, in a, under, a, under a formal governance approach to and, and understand the business imperatives, cost reductions or new revenue opportunities that these companies might be looking for or organisations might be looking for, um, and we'll work with them to help them develop a leading customer experience for whatever it is that they provide as a service or a product, to drive operational efficiencies within their own business, to build strategic competitiveness, to look to help them you know, differentiate themselves in the market, and also to help them learn from, from what we think is, is, is a world-leading approach to developing an internal, sustainable innovation engine. So a lot of that is about listening to customers, and, and this goes back to the comment that you made, made right, right at, the billion, at the beginning. There, there, there is there meant to be an animation on that, which obviously has not, not been picked up for some reason, maybe whatever. But uh, uh, the, the, the animation is, is the galloping horse. Yeah? Um, and so we... A lot, so the whole customer innovation engagement program is about listening to customers. Clearly, that's important. But as you were alluding to earlier on, you know, you can't just ask them what they want. And, and clearly, you know, the, the quote here is that you know, if, if Henry Ford had asked his customers what they want, they, they would have said, I, "I want a faster horse or a cheaper horse or whatever." Um, you know, it's about interpreting unmet needs, and that, that's that's the really difficult part. Um, and so, as part of our engagement process, we've developed some uh, sort of systematic approaches that we take to that. A lot of that we do where we can at a dashboard, where we bring customers into those, into a managed um, innovation workshop environment, and we'll go through with them. And, and, and most of that is about them talking about what, where they want to go, where their business is going, what their in business imperatives are, and so on. Um, and some of it is about us revealing to them innovation topics that may be relevant to that, and then taking that forward. But, but it's a model that we've taken out, not just so we don't only do it at Astro, it's a model that we've taken out around the world, and as you can see, particularly in across the Asia-Pac region, in Singapore and Australia and in India, and obviously in the US as well, where we'll, we'll, we'll create a, a, an innovation environment, for instance, in a hotel or whatever, and, and, and have a very focused, very well prepared event with one or with more customers. Sometimes we can do, we do this in a set, on a sector basis. For instance, you know we, we did one recently for UK retailers. Um, uh, you know we might do one for log logistics companies or whatever. Um, uh, and and to take them through and walk them through a process whereby they're opening up about where they want to go. And our our job is to try to interpret that. And to, and to understand those unmet needs. Actually, it's not only in one-off events. It's not just come to a workshop and something magic happens. Yeah. It's, about, it's about developing a one-to-one -one relationship between people like us in, our, in, my, in my team uh, and, and innovation leaders or business problem leaders, business issue, issue, issue owners in those companies 
on a continuous basis that's outside of the contractual relationship. Uh, it's about developing a, a trust-based innovation dialogue. Um, and from that, we attempt to, to determine unmet needs and use those unmet needs. And this is, goes back to something I was saying right at the beginning. Now, as part of the Chief Architect's Office, part of our, our challenge, actually, is to take that in a systematic way back into BT so that it can understand more effectively how to um, develop and, and roll out platforms and uh, uh, portfolio offerings going forward. So I've said this already that uh, you know, innovation is about su successful commercial exploitation of ideas. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we, we try and uh, uh, work with our customers around is, is this idea of building a sustainable innovation engine. How do you make that? How do you make your company, uh, how do you turn your company into, uh, into having a capability whereby everybody is able to embrace that? Um, and you know, we, we, we've, we've spent quite a lot of time looking at this. Uh, clearly, as I've already said, one of the key elements of, to this is being able to leverage a wider innovation ecosystem than you've got within your own single organisation, irrespective of how big you are. And we'll, you know, this this works with the biggest innovators in the world, as well as as well as small small companies or public sector organisations and so on. Um, you need to apply a systematic approach uh, to innovation. You need to enable people to be able to understand what they need to do if they've got ideas and how to take those forward. One of, the, one of the areas that we, we uh, we've found is extremely valuable is being able to turn um, ideas or hypotheses into something that's tangible. People can see, touch and feel very quickly rather than a more traditional approach, which is to, is to, you know, is to write it up in some kind of document. Clearly, you need to have a portfolio-based approach to innovation and not, 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 not putting all your eggs in one basket, as it were. Um, uh, and as I say, articulation is, is, is absolutely as key as the actual invention in the first place. You might have a great invention, but if you can't articulate the value that this is likely to bring, then it's, you know, it's not going to turn into innovation because it won't go anywhere. Um, obviously, measuring the right performance metrics within the company in the context of innovation is, is, is critical. Um, as I've already said, it's about focusing on the customer experience. It's not about a focus on technology per se. Technology enablers are absolutely useful and are often the things that support or trigger new innovations, but the customer experience is absolutely key. And clearly, we need, a, we need to have a culture whereby senior management and so on, or the, the organisation is able to live with a certain degree of risk and uncertainty in terms of taking innovations forward. But those risks need to be well managed. And um, if you've got the right metrics in place, then you, you, can, you can be, you can be um, uh, more able to de-risk some of those innovation approaches. Just, just picking on one, one or two of those areas um, in a little bit more detail, one, one of the areas that we've... We, so as part of our innovation capability, we've built up um, a team... Uh, that we call the ATC, the Advanced Technology Centre, and their, their, their key focus is rapid prototyping, and I mean very rapid prototyping. Um, so, and, and often the prototyping would be to take, take a concept and to turn that into some kind of animated or flash demonstrator, but that, that, that works it to a certain degree. Obviously hasn't done all the, the back-end um, thinking in terms of how something might be integrated or rolled out or whatever, but it's about moving this moving the point of invention forward by assisting in the articulation of what that might might be and again this is something that we now do with our customers or for our customers as well as for ourselves um, and there, there are there are companies in the UK particularly in the retail sector and in the uh, travel and transport sector where we've been able to work with them understand some ideas that they've got find the technology enablers and bring that together into a rapid prototype and deploy that in their environment for them within, you know, depending on the complexity of what it might be, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. Yeah, so that's that, that order of, uh, that scale of um, response. And that helps them understand, well, what's the customer journey for this thing that we've, called, we've thought up? How would this actually work in practice? What are the real key issues that we need to... Um, consider in terms of integration and so on going forward. 
The other area that we've spent a lot of time working on and, and, uh, and uh, find a lot of interest from, up from our clients and, and partners is in um, what you might tritely call a new ideas scheme, but a system by which you enable individuals across the business to actually put forward their ideas and so on. So it's about leveraging a really useful asset that you've got, which is basically your, your employees and or your customers, suppliers and so on. Um, and we have a new idea scheme now that we revamped completely three years ago. Uh, and we, we have shown you know, significant uh, revenue and cost-saving benefit far in excess of the costs of running the scheme. We developed a scheme that's got very lightweight management. We have three people that run, actually manage the scheme. Everyone in BT is able to access the scheme. That's, uh, that's 110,000 employees plus partners, contractors and so on are able to, do, to get access to it too. Um, uh, ideas that are put forward are responded to, first of all, recognised as as, and receipted within 24 hours, first sift within five working days, and, a, and an expert review from a federated panel of, of 90 experts who have got, who've got normal day jobs but are able to, to review ideas like this within, within 20 working days. Um, and, and obviously associated with that also are all kinds of rewards for, um, for those good ideas that get taken forward that, that uh, uh, can lead up to um, you know, payments of up to £30,000 for individuals that generate great, great new revenue or cost savings. The other thing that we do is target... Let's keep it fresh with targeted campaigns. And again, targeted campaigns and new ideas and idea harvesting is something that we're finding resonates well with our customers and, again, is an area that, that they're really keen for us to work with them on to, to, um, to do what I've said, which is to, is to find a better way of harvesting that uh, great pool of resources that they've got amongst their employees and their customers. Um, so... In terms of uh, more discipline and, and, and having a systematic approach to innovation as a company, um, I've mentioned the fact that we, do, we have a host, hosted managed ideas campaign. It's on a global basis. We have a dedicated innovation resource, so we have dedicated teams uh, that can help with innovation for those people that have got so far with an idea but then can't take it any further. Um, we provide them with access to, to toolkits, and the toolkits are categorised for people that are sort of basic um, uh, practitioner and expert level innovators, depending on what their role and function is and what, the, what their, their background is in the company. Um, and those innovation practitioners that are expert are able to go in and, and flexibly work with people that have got new ideas and take those things forward for them. We spent quite a lot of time working on how do you put the metrics around innovation. And... So we have an innovation impact score that we use within the company. The innovation impact score um, has to be... Uh, well, the innovation impact score relates to the benefits that would accrue to the company over a three-year period uh, or once that, um, that innovation is, is, is implemented. Um, and that, as I say, might be around revenue, it might be around cost savings. But... The, uh, one of the key elements is, is getting whoever it is that owns that revenue line or owns that impact, that cost effectiveness, that cost efficiency saving. They're the ones, they're the final arbiters in terms of what the impact of that innovation is. Um, and every year, those metrics are built into our scorecards, they're built into our senior manager scorecards and so on. And so this is my final slide, I think. And um, so I've talked a lot about what we've done and I feel a little bit conscious that I'm um, sort of trying to evangelise something and, and um, uh, you, know, you, may, you may or may not have a view about how, how good or bad that is and we'll find out in a minute, I guess. Um, but, but just to say that, so, so 10 months, um, just at the end of the last financial year, so around March last year, I did some work with an uh, industry analyst called Bathwick and they decided to undertake a, um, a benchmarking review of innovation uh, in IT outsourcing contracts. Um, and there is, a, there is a report, a short report that they produced, which if anyone's interested in, I can, I can, I can share that with you. But they, they ranked us amongst a whole range of companies that you can see there. Um, and, and, and the outcome of that was that their, their view was that our approach, was, was, we came out second out of that, out of that uh, review after 10 months in terms of customer innovation embedded in IT outsourcing contracts, um, which to me was a, was a, was a, well, it was a pretty good result, actually, uh, having only put it, been doing it for 10 months. 
Um, and, and, you know, our, the, their view was that our approach to say that this is a, a, a low-cost, high-impact um, capability that we use within our own business and within our customers' businesses um, was, it was exactly the right kind of strategy for where we are now. Um, uh, and, and that was a good endorsement. And so, as I say, if anyone's interested in that, I can, I can share that with you. Obviously, the only downside from my point of view is that now my objective is to get to number one, which is um, you know, a yet bigger challenge. Um, so, so with that, I'll close. And uh, apologies if I've, if I've overrun. I think we've probably got a little bit of time for, for questions. Thank you. <laughs>